So when you, when you get your pebble, the first thing it's going to ask you to do is to register, sign up for an account. OK, now there's going to be an app, the Pebble app. And this is important because the, uh, let's go here. the Pebble app basically manages the software on your Pebble. So it's how you get software onto it, it's how you remove it. And it's also how the Pebble communicates to, to the internet. And so essentially, it's going to be a Bluetooth connection from, from your watch to your, to your phone. Um, so the thing that I've I noticed when getting on the setup is occasionally the Pebble app, it runs in the background. It occasionally just dies. When it dies, you have no network connectivity on your watch. So I was looking at documentation like, OK, well, how do I just fetch data from my watch to you know, the internet or whatever? And um, you can do it a couple of ways, but mostly you have a uh, you can use a JavaScript bridge um, that runs on the Pebble app itself and its own sandbox, and then uses that as a proxy to the internet. So that's that's one thing that was interesting. Um, so that means you don't need the phone. You do. Yeah, you, you need it on all the time. and close enough range and all that. So it's not completely like throwing in the basement. You're up like on the fourth floor kind of thing. Oh, it's not going to work. Let me just do this real quick. Okay. Now, um, you have a bunch of different watch faces. Um, like I've got like you know box office stuff, which is kind of lame, but hey, I was trying it out. Um, there's a one called Leaf, which is like you know how I control my Nest. And I was kind of making a point that it's simpler to change the temperature on my Nest from my watch than it is from the Nest application. And that was very striking to me because then it tells me that the Nest application really needs a lot of work on the UI. If my, if my wrist is, you know, takes less taps. So that's something to kind of think about. <clears throat> um, there's a, the uh, third one there is called something called uh, Misfit. And it supposedly tracks your sleeping patterns and activity. So I was like, hey, let's sleep with my watch. Wife doesn't think it's weird at all, sleeping with stuff. But, um, <laughs> So it's not really accurate, I've noticed, but uh, it does give me a sense of, you know, I'm, I've slept, you know, six hours, seven hours, but had only an hour, hour and a half of deep sleep. So that I'm just completely passed out, I guess. Um, so that's been interesting information for me to say, maybe I should go to bed earlier, stop playing so much GTA with that guy over there. Um, it's awesome. <clears throat> anyway, um, and the other app uh, on, on the end is, uh, is a, uh, uh, watch face app from uh, the Weather Channel. And so that one actually will tell you the time and also give you the weather. Because the watch doesn't have GPS, it's got to ask the phone for that information. So everything goes through the Pebble app. So the one that, that, that tracks your sleep, does it, does it have a motion sensor or does it do a heartbeat thing? Well, the watch has an accelerometer okay, and a magnetometer. So a motion sensor. Mm -hmm. And all that's stored on the device itself. I'm glad you. That's a good, great segue, actually. <clears throat> so, so you can have your apps can be a, a, a couple of different ways. You can have them running completely standalone on the watch itself, or you can have them as kind of a companion app uh, running on your iPhone or, or Android device. So, if you get any heavy computational stuff you need to do or heavy parsing, it's recommended that you have a companion app do all of that and then send the data directly to the device. Yes, ma'am. Oh, he was watching. Okay. All right. Um, so they use a key value pair. Uh, yes? For the actual companion app thing, so do you still have to write, then do you have to write like that companion app either in uh, like uh, Swift or Java, or can you just write Or Java-C. Well, yeah, so you can either do it, um, there's a, uh, a JavaScript um, beta, okay. and the, or you can use, um, for if you just want maximum compatibility between both iOS and Android, or iOS and Objective C, so or I, iOS and Android, um, so you can do it that way. Okay. Um, I can get into it a little bit later, but it's it's just kind of weird, like having this. I don't know. I've never had a smartwatch before, let alone this companion app always running. 
So I only noticed when it died is because the weather app no longer gave me any weather. It just said loading or something like that. Anyway, so you have up to eight apps running or loaded on your device. And you have this kind of app locker, which is, I, I'm assuming that is apps that are on the iPhone, but not on the actual watch itself. Oh, you've got one. You should be giving this talk then. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so, um, so as a developer, you have this developer section here. And um, you need to have this IP. You need to be on the same Wi-Fi network as your computer or same network because you're going to send, uh, basically send uh, the code from your laptop directly to your, to your phone to the Pebble app, which then loads it onto your, to your watch. Yes? Did you say you have a maximum of eight apps? Yes. At time? That's it? Yes, that's it. That's crazy. That's yeah. It's not a very big device. <laughs> yeah, it's. But I, but I mean, like, you would expect it to be how, many, how much memory is left or something. Oh, yeah. That's what the locker's for, though, because yeah. you can, like, hot swap hey, yeah. it on the spot. Fixed slot. So yep. Yeah. Fixed slot. So, so, anyway, so it's. And then there's a, I guess there's a cloud um, Pebble thing, IDE, that you can create your apps with a web browser, and then it just syncs to your Pebble. I didn't do that, so um, I got this. All right. So you, I'm going to switch over to my laptop here. Do, do, do. Oops. Cool. All right. So you want to download the um, um, I downloaded the uh, Pebble SDK and uh, oh, that's some other code I was looking at. <laughs> All right. And sweet. Thank you, Safari. Anyway, all right, so there's a shell script on the Mac. It's a shell script that you would download and then execute that downloads the actual uh, SDK. It does require Python to be installed, and also, also requires virtual NV uh, to be installed as part of one of your Python um, um, packages. OK, so all right, so I'm going to create a I guess can't see that, can you? That's that's a little small. Thank you. Oh crap! How big did I make that? I'll give you an idea. All right. So the main um, the main. Uh, Command you can do right is, is command is Pebble, and so you have a new convert convert projects blah 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 blah. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a brand new project. Um, call it uh, I don't know, Hello World, and you're going to say new. Okay, and <clears throat> and so you're going to have this. Uh, this app info.json, that's like a manifest. And so it's going to give you things like who made the app and what version is it and, and uh, what media do you have, like uh, raw files or images and things of that nature. Um, and also whether or not this is a watch face. So if I'm going to explain time. <coughs> now, the thing that I've noticed about the watch face is that it's, it's loaded. Um, you know, I should probably do. Uh, how about you got the pebble? How about that? I've been talking a lot about it. Let's just show it to you. Oh, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> so let's try it this way. <laughs> cool. All right. Now you've got your um, your. This is really weird. Um, can someone come up here and hold the camera for me? 
<laughs> Thanks. Make sure you get the tasting beer. Okay, cool. All right. So the, the bottom button here is going to be um, like your downward arrow, and then the top one is goes top, and then you have the middle one, which is to select whatever item that you have. On the other side of it, you've got your, I guess it's like your back button. And then you have these uh, little pins, for, that's how you, you charge it. And so, yeah, it's not, it's not too terrible. So I'll, I'll tap in and then get music and, and notifications. And so the notifications is interesting because it tells me things like, hey, this is your, um, someone's calling, I can, you know, accept the call, I can refuse the call, this is who texted me, emails, things of that nature. So it's pretty cool. Alarms, which are, you know, <coughs> there's no speaker on the, on the device, so it just buzzes. Uh, and then watch faces gives you the different watch, watch faces that you can use. So for example, I can just select the weather channel. And since the app isn't, well, there you go. So now it gives me the actual data and says, in Papillion, it's three degrees. And I'm like, well, I'm not in Papillion, so this kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so, so that gave me thinking, well, I'll write my own weather app, and, but that was excessive futility. It takes a lot of stuff here. Anyway, so, um, and this Misfit, is what I mentioned earlier, and it gives you my weekly activity. Um, I slept for four hours and 53 minutes. My goal was seven hours. I may need to take some more naps during the day, I guess. And then my deep sleep was an hour and three. So, so it's been pretty cool for that kind of thing. Um, oh yeah, and I got to show like my, my Nest one, it's pretty cool. I won't change it because my wife might be a little salty about it. <laughs> Come on. Turn it way down while you're here. Yeah. <laughs> like, hon, I was just trying to save power. Yeah, she won't like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's kind of cool. I mean, I could just change it from here. So, but again, it's using the Pebble app to make all this communication. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, cool. Thanks. I'll, I'll get that. Thank you. All right. Yes, you can, sir. Yes, you can. Any questions so far? No. All right. Perfect. Does it have a headphone jack on it? No, it does not. It does. Okay. So, cool. and then I noticed a bug in iOS 8 where it was giving like the wrong name of the album, and I was like, that's not the music. And you look on the phone, and it's wrong on the phone, so Pebble was actually right. The phone was wrong. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, we created this. Oh, I'm talking without actually. Bugs today. Can I connect to Dev Center? All right. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just going to literally do nothing and just create the project and put it on, put it on the device. And so you do that by going into the directory. Um, well, over here you can see Pebble. You can see install. We're actually going to build it first. And it's going to compile it. All that good stuff. And now, what's nice is it, it'll tell you what your footprint in RAM is going to be. That's that's very helpful. And then what your free RAM. So, 24k of free heap isn't a lot. Oh, so now it tells me I need to know the IP address was to install this. So I'm going to say phone and phone dot two dot two one six. Okay. Can I kick this off? Aha, I can't kick myself off. All right. <clears throat> so look at my watch here. Install it on the device, or it should. Then 
press a button. That's that's all it does. Oh, that's cool. And then it gives you, you know, your up and your down. So real simple, get code on there. Um, I want to do something a little, a little, oh, a little different than, um, than. Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> How about that for a live demo? Huh? <laughs> and then we just select to uh, get rid of it. Now, if you notice, there's kind of these animations. We kind of slid over, I guess, from right to left. Um, that's kind of a, a normal a normal uh, kind of animation that you can set. I think you can set other animations, but I haven't gotten that far. OK, so that was th just a brief Hello World. I'm going to show the app that I've worked on for a little longer than that. Um, and oops. Does anyone know, anyone here heard of the show Archer? Archer, yeah. Sweet. OK, I've, I've just <laughs> discovered it, thanks to this guy over here. OK, so I'm really late, I'm really late to the party. I relate to the party. <laughs> so what I decided to do for my, oh, that's right, I deleted, I deleted it. OK. Let's put it back. I created an app, simple one, just to show pictures. They, they, they are PG pictures, so it's, it's, it's OK. Um, oops. Uh, <laughs> okay, so build. Okay. All right. I should install it. Doo, doo, doo. Oh, fail to install. Why did it fail to install it? I guess I was a little too anxious. All right, so here is my Archer app. <laughs> yeah, there it is. In the little face detection. OK, now, so what's interesting about so I have a bug with this, OK, by the way. This was hastily coded. But if I select, nothing comes over. But if I backwards and then do it, then you can see different characters. So yeah. Gillette, and then there's Mallory. Then it's all I have. It's like three or four of them. So <laughs> I, I thought this was a good way to kind of go into how to get an app on the device, how to display images, how to do um, uh, button events, and how to do some animations. So, it's, so this is all one file, or there we go, for good or for worse. And um, if you look at, this is really sucks, all right. And it kind of just slides back. So the thing that I noticed is that their hierarchy, um, uh, there we go. The hierarchy for dealing with um, for dealing with um, um, navigation is very similar to iOS. Um, I don't know anything about Android, so I, I can't say how similar it is to Android. <coughs> um, let me. Show this. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So one of the things that in in this app um, called Archer Archer Slideshow, um, when you are a watch face. Uh, you are just right on that first level of apps, and if you, and if you touch, if you use any of the buttons, then you go into the main navigation of the device itself. So, I didn't feel like screwing with that too much. I'll let that as as false. Um, app keys here, um, those are basically how the Pebble app, I believe, talks with your application, either Android or iOS. So you have this kind of, uh, yeah, key. And then the um, and then whatever key goes here, your companion app has to know what that is. And so the uh, Pebble app acts as a proxy essentially. Wakes up your app, 
or your app can wake up the, the watch app on the Pebble. Again, keeping it simple. And then with the media, I just, I just put the images here. I used the Piximator, shrunk everything down, get rid of all the colors, and put them in here. And that was, that was it. And all that gets compiled into this uh, package that gets sent up to the, to the device itself. It does. It does. Um, I've seen like, like like raw. You do like a raw file. Mm -hmm. If you want to do parsing, I guess that kind of stuff. Um, so this is all in one file called ArcherTime.c, and yes, it is in C. That's the. But it's interesting because um, I wasn't really used to having to worry about declaring my functions ahead of time before I use them. Yeah, that's supposed to be so, so, Yeah. So um, I had this really weird problem where I tried to reuse code and finally I really couldn't reuse it that well because it didn't know about the code when I tried to parse it. The compiler just kind of freaked out on me. So just declare it. You're fine. So anyway, so um, do, do, do. let's go down here. It's not that big. It's only 100. Yeah. Right. I didn't see any examples of header files and all that, so I'll like, I just throw that in here and call it a day. Um, so it, when you do your initialization, it creates a window. And in this case here, you're creating this click config provider, which all it really does is have another function for you can set up your callbacks for your different events. I'm tapping the up button, I'm tapping the down button, and I'm tapping the, the select button, for example, or no buttons. And so that would be ham. Ooh, where is it handled? Yeah, you gotta wonder about the little OS that's running on that. Thing. Yeah, I looked it up and completely forgot what it was, what it was, what it was called. <laughs> but it's really tiny. Yeah, I mean that's probably why they only have eight slots. Mm -hmm. So they only you know, they're minimizing the amount of code they gotta. Yeah. And run on this stuff. Memory. Yeah. So um, it, you're you're doing layout in this case manually. Um, there are some similarities with iOS if you've done it um, by hand, where you've got your frames and you've got your bounds. Uh, Pebble does it inverse, backwards of that. Um, well, you technically, technically iOS does it inverse of everybody else. <laughs> I'll say the Mac really does it inverse, <laughs> since it's lower left. Anyway, OK. <laughs> OK, so um, one of the things that kind of blew me away, if you notice, there's this resource ID Gillette and resource ID Mallory and Woodhouse. Um, this probably took the most amount of time to figure out what the hell this was. Um, in your app info.json, the name of your resource, in this case, uh, Gillette, probably misspell that, but anyway, um, I can't refer to them as Gillette. I have to prepend it with that resource underscore ID. Um, and so then it knows, and it, what was I? Sorry, and it, and it picks it up. Um, well, that, that's, that's a number, right? Yes, that, that, yep, that is an unsigned int. So the precompiler, I'm guessing, probably does a lot of that stuff for me. Um, I was expecting to put in strings, and it's like, mm -mm -mm, sorry, wrong data type. Um, <clears throat> But you know, we, we create our bitmaps. We create the layer that the bitmap is going to is going to be is going to be displayed on, and I'm I'm basically saying in line 75 exactly where that goes. So the rectangle in iOS would be CG rect. In this case, it's, it's just G rect. Um, you get your x and y coordinate, and then you have your width and height. So to make everything simple, I made all the images uh, 144 by 144. And why I picked that number, I went to Wikipedia and looked it up and said, okay, well, it's, the, the, that's the width at least. So I don't want any scaling issues and skewing and all that. Um, and then, then you attach the bitmap to the layer, and then you add the layer itself, the bitmap layer to the window layer itself. You have multiple window layers oh. if you want to. I didn't get that far. I just have like multiple windows. And so mine's like really resource, probably heavy. And Really bad coding practice, I'm sure. So if you have multiple windows, what do you just, just delete one? It's 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 basically a, it's a it's a stack. So you you can just bang, you just bang, push bang. it and it'll it'll, it'll all pop it off. Yeah, okay. So when you hit the back button, it pops it right off. Um, and then you know layers for also for displaying text. 
in this case, I'm, I'm saying that I want a layer no, no larger, no taller than 20 pixels. Oh, these are all by pixels, by the way. And I'm going to start at x0 and y, uh, the height of the display minus 20. So it's going to be kind of a line at the bottom. Take up the full width and then height there. And then you know press a button and that's it. And, that, and that's the very first um, screen that you see with just Archer and it says press a button. That's all it does. Um, the thing I wanted to do, obviously, is you know, I want to you know, click on stuff and have something happen. And so my click config provider, click config provider, it's right here somewhere. Here we go. Um, I'm only listening for this select uh, event or button, I guess. Not many events in the button. And then I'm giving it the uh, actual function that handles that, which is the select click handler, which is right up, right up here. Now, this isn't in this case here. You know, global is kind of nice. You know, it's kind of bad practice nowadays. It's small. It's program <laughs> yeah. Plan, yeah. So I have this current index, um, and what I'm really trying to say is I want to be able to cycle through the images. Um, I've got three images. I want to cycle through all three of them. Technically four because I got the initial well, Archer uh, splash screen, I guess. And uh, I don't want to crash the app, and so I have this little guard here. Make sure that if, if I'm going to overflow that, then. You don't want your watch to be hacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll do that. Um, and this display image, this is where I have my bug, actually. Oh, and so originally, because. The resources are, are done by these IDs, and so I have an array of the IDs. I set that up initially, and then I just kind of go through each one that I need to. In this case, when I'm displaying, let's say, Mallory or Woodhouse, I'll create the window here, and um, I'm assuming and hoping that as I'm adding windows and layers together, that the system is managing, I guess what we call the retain count. I don't know. Um, it would get kind of ugly really quick if I had to know ahead of time in a global context what I was doing, which I don't know. So again, this is a test program. So don't, don't kill me, please. <clears throat> so um, same sort of thing, you know, create my bitmap, create my layer, that sort of thing. Um, and there's this add, no, add child. So when you create the window and you, you push it to the global, it's a global stack. You can choose whether you want it to be animated or not, and that's what it slides in. So you have multiple windows sliding on top of each other, essentially, as a stack. And then the back button just pops them off, and it does reverse animation. And hopefully, cleans up the memory for me. Um, so this could be actually pictures of your kids. Or yeah, it could be anything. Yeah. So, so this is actually kind of cool. I mean, that's useful. Never thought of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for making you feel better. 100 times better. That's awesome. No, really. You could, you know, pictures of, from your phone. You could, you could show so them this, up. This, this is the code that's actually running on the, on the watch. Phone, right? Yeah. So there's no interaction yep. with the phone itself, just the watch. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, because that just was too much time to get all that to work. Gotcha. But um, again, I'm going to have this since Sunday. I wrote this today, so it hasn't crashed today or yet. It's crashed earlier. Um, and it says, your, your software has crashed. Nice little, <laughs> nice little pop-up, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, but the, one, of the, one of the prerequisites, if you're going to put this stuff, since it's a, essentially a monochrome device, um, you, you have to have grayscale images. And um, I'm going sh to show, bless you. So you have an ecosystem. You have a grayscale converter. You have a you have the thing that puts them on the, <laughs> the file for, you, you know. You, you, you can do some you know, stuff with that. This is like $1,500 maybe. <laughs> I don't know about all that. That'd be awesome, 1500 bucks for a couple hours of work. <coughs> See if I can kick myself off here. All right. OK, so. Um, So again, I'm going to tap in. And one thing I want, to, I want to show is that you can provide an icon. And that's the actual icon there at the bottom. Oh, okay. And then you can just, and then because obviously it will flip the uh, color scheme. 
back and forth. And that's, shoot. Yeah, so that little, little bitty guy right there is going to be it. So to give you a sense of the sizes, sizes of the files here. So one, four, 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 the icon is 28 by 28. <laughs> right, you know, so um, but anyway, that's really all I know. Like I said, it's been since Sunday, I've been messing Very with this cool. and, and uh, that code work today. So, any questions? How much is the watch cost? You get it for like 89 bucks, I think. Really? I went to Best Buy. Well, I was looking for something else at Best Buy. I was like, oh, they have a Pebble. <laughs> I'll come back and get it. And so I went back a couple weeks later to get it. It was like last one. And there, so I just snapped it up and Thought I'd give it a shot, and they got the steel version now too. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Um, the uh, I wish I would have got time to get into the other side of it. There's just too much to write an iPhone app, and then have to worry about the communication with the Pebble and the back and forth. It was like this is better just to have something on the watch itself. So, well, this is actually a cool app. Like I said, I mean, people love, would like to have pictures. Something. I mean, you could build a companion app on the phone, right? That would like download your yeah. whatever you have on your, or yeah. Flickr or so, so things, grayscale them, and then ship them over. The so, the, so the thing is, so when you're sending data from the phone to the to the watch, it is over Bluetooth. So you do have restrictions on the amount of data that you can send. I think it's a hundred and forty-four bytes. Really? Or something like that so at a time. Messaging is all you're going to really be able to send. Right. So, so basically, you'll have to kind of chunk that through if you're going to send. How big is one of your small PNGs that you're sending? Um, 2K. So well, you we, can still do that. Yeah, it just takes a little but while. You have to write well, the little can, app to do yeah. it. Yeah. You JPEG them too, and they do smaller, so it's yeah. black and white. Yeah, and the, well, yeah. Yeah, you're 144 by 144. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So I mean, so that's the thing that I noticed is that you'll have to, you know. Chunk of three when you send it across. So, but no, no questions. Um, well, I think that's cool. I have to remember what that yeah. Oh, um, you're sending it grayscale. But why not save space and be completely black, white, monochrome? You could. Just, just to save, you know, two K down to. Absolutely, you could. I just cover it. Because it's, it's pure monochrome, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. it yep. Like you had a bitmap conversion on your iPhone. Um, I just use Pixelmator to do it. That was kind of my cheap way to do it, just to kind of experiment with it and try a different hello world that's been done. So I, I made actually in the code, it looked like at one point you were converting a PNG down to bitmap representation. Uh, so yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, it's all, it does all that for me. Okay. So I'm just like, here's your resource, make it happen, make it so. So those images are actually on the phone. Yes. And that's, I'm just referencing the, the IDs. Yeah. Now this reminds me a little bit, I guess, of OpenGL, when I'm, where you have like your textures and you have a kind of an ID with that texture, yeah. and that's kind of what I'm assuming this kind of this works. But anyway, anyway. yes, sir. I haven't seen anything. When I looked on Wikipedia, they seem to have like. You know, this is like made it seem like it's more of an aesthetic kind of thing, like this different case and different band kind of thing. Not much yeah. different. Yeah, I think it's slightly better, but the uh, functionality is exactly the same. And you have like corning glass on it. So it's like all awesome. Do you ever get a chance to knock around with the JavaScript data at all? I I, I didn't uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one was you can well the example they have is is the JavaScript is actually on the watch. Which gets sent to the Pebble, and the Pebble runs the code. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, the, the Pebble app itself runs runs the uh, the, the uh, JavaScript code, okay. and it's on sandbox, which is interesting. Um, 
So it's showing like how you can, you know, basically take JSON and just convert it and just psh, pipe it back to the uh, to the watch. So in the background, so if the Pebble app just pushed out background on your iOS device, you think it's quite a bit. Um, I've had that like once where the app actually was killed, okay. and or it just crashed. I'm not quite sure. Um, it just otherwise it would just it'd be kind of you don't even notice, which is. And the battery life on, on the phone's been pretty decent for all intents and purposes. I haven't noticed anything out of the ordinary of, of it. Because Bluetooth is always on. Even though it's uh, these, the Bluetooth LE, I should probably show that to you guys if you guys want to see it. But um, just real quick. <laughs> no, Kevin. Um, you noticed the Pebble app bug crash? Just one time. Okay. It's just one time. Um, and that's when I realized, oh, yeah, it's probably how it's, in, you know, gateway to the internet because stuff just didn't work. Um, so that kind of threw me that kind of threw me off. I wasn't expecting that, but you know, what do I expect for 80 bucks? I want to use like Wi-Fi or cellular. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. This doesn't seem to want to Okay. Let me Sorry, I'm disconnect here. And show Okay, so one thing I thought was really strange is in my settings here under Bluetooth, it you have this Pebby, the Pebble 3D V8, and then the Pebble LE. Oh, so it's probably using a bigger channel to do bigger messaging and connection stuff. I don't know. And the internet connection probably has to go across to the 3D8 or something. Like that, mess, the super right, because now the LE just just disconnected. Oh, that's why it's 144 ca characters. Because that's all you have in the LE message box. That's what the, that's where the 144 is. Right. So, if, so in the case of iOS, when you develop for iOS, you have to oh, and connect it back again, the LE. So you'll have to uh, have like core Bluetooth, a bunch of other stuff set up, and also as as a uh, um, external accessory f for that to work. So, but again, I can get that get that far. So. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I know uh, Apple made a big push uh, when they introduced LE was for some of the messaging stuff. Yeah. And they I talked. Mean, it, it's very short messaging. It's all you can get across LE, 140 or whatever characters limit is. But that's yep. probably what that limit, message limit is. Yeah, but if I show, um, I know I'm taking up your time, so I'll make this brief. Um, under notifications. Oh. Pick up trash. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it also picks up, um, at least in the case of, uh, of the phone, not just, uh, but also calendaring events as well, or reminders. And then we have for these kind of hop around on, onto, the, onto the wrist, so. And uh, that's it, if you have any other questions. Oh, cool. That was very really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. We're going to go uh, try to, we'll move pretty quick through some uh, offline mobile web app stuff. So for uh, a long time, one of the biggest you know, drawbacks of mobile web versus native was this ability to be offline, to work offline, to do stuff offline. Um, and I'm going to show you some HTML5 API protocols that allow you to do offline in a few different ways uh, right through mobile web. Um, this is mobile web, but most of these things can all are just straight HTML5 and JavaScript stuff, so it's really can be used for, for anything. So uh, we already did introductions, so you kind of know who I am. That's my Twitter in case people want to follow me. Uh, so some of the technologies we're going to take a look at. Uh, app cache, some other ways to do this. Cookies, I mean, that's really kind of some offline stuff that's already been there. Storage of data on the, on the device itself that had nothing to do with the server. That's kind of where we started with this. Then there's framework-based storage. So if you want to do mobile web and wrap it in something like a phone gap or something like that, that has its own kind of built in. It's kind of a hybrid approach to doing this offline. Um, I'm not really going to talk much about that because it kind of is different based on what framework you're using. If you're using phone gap, you're using something else, how they implement that, usually with some sort of JavaScript bridge to a native storage facility. So, but we'll do stuff a little different to that. Um, what we will talk about are these HTML5 storage stuff. Uh, web storage, which includes local storage and session storage. 
uh, we'll look at WebSQL, indexed DB, and the file system API. So these are the offline storage capabilities that were basically added in HTML5. And basically, we'll just kind of all we're going to do really is talk about the differences between them, what are some of their advantages, and the different things that we can do with them versus uh, the other API. So we'll move fairly quick. So we'll start with AppCache. AppCache is the biggest thing you need to start with. No matter which one of these uh, protocols you want to use, you need to start with an AppCache because AppCache is what allows you to tell the browser um, to store your HTML, JavaScript offline, any of your application logic or user interface. If you want that to cache offline, you have to do it. And it's a more advanced cache than just what standardly would get cached in a browser that you don't really have a lot of control over. App cache gives you very specific control of what you want to cache. On the right side here, this is an example of a specific cache file. So a couple of things um, that are kind of interesting about app cache is no file will update unless the app cache changes. So if you put an app cache in place, put it out on your server, and then make a change to your HTML, no one is going to no one that's already been to your website is ever going to see that change because you didn't change the app cache file. So it won't look at cache headers like what normally happens with standard cache. The only thing it looks at is has your your manifest file changed. And then once that says it's changed, then it'll run through all of your other cache headers to see if any of those individual files that this said to cache have changed since then. So rule one is always put a date and timestamp at the top of your app cache. And every time you make a change to your website, you make that change. The easiest way to do this is make it part of your build process. Use Gulp or whatever Grunt, whatever you're using to kind of build all your assets and add this in to say, rebuild my app cache every time I make a change to a file and change the date and timestamp at the top of my app cache. That'll make sure that it updates for everybody else. That's usually the easiest way to handle this. Um, the other thing that's weird about it is because of the timing and the way that cache is downloaded, someone won't get your newest files until the second time they load the page after, the, after their cache changed. And the reason that happens is, the first thing is going to happen is the browser is going to ask, do you already have this stuff cached? And the browser is going to say, yes, it's cached, and it's going to load the cache file. Then the server is going to respond and say, hey, I have new things. And then the browser is going to say, OK, and it's going to download all the new stuff. But the web page is already loaded because it loaded it from cache. So then if they hit the refresh again, or if you're listening for a cache change event, then you can pop up like, hey, reload this page, or you can force the I don't really recommend forcing the reload on yourself because then it looks like your page loads and then reloads all on its own, which is just kind of an odd user experience. But usually what you want to do is pop up some sort of message, tell them, hey, there's a new version of this app available. Hit the reload and reload it, or kind of message them and say, hey. Or if it's not a big update, you can just, sit, just let them wait. And then the next time they come back, it'll load back out of that cache that's already been updated. So it's not that big a deal, but in development, App cache is just a real pain in the ass when you're actually doing development continuously changing. So in our build process, we disable app cache for our development server so it doesn't turn on until it gets to staging. So our QA server, our development servers don't actually app cache stuff. When it gets over to staging, that's when we app cache or if we're testing specifically app cached type functionality. So the next thing you're going to do is in this cache section underneath that cache. So those capitalized words actually mean something in this file with the colons after them. So um, you put cache manifest at the top of the file. It has to be there so it knows it's a manifest. Also, you have to change your web server. This has to be served as a different content type. So it doesn't actually matter, doesn't matter what the name of the file is. Usually, it's application.cache.manifest uh, is, is the, what people usually name it. You can actually name it anything you want, but it has to be served as content type of text slash cache dash manifest. And if you don't make that change, then it's not actually going to create on the, the browser won't know what to do with it. So you got to do that. Um, and then in this cache section, I have to list everything that I want to cache. So I just kind of cut out a lot of stuff out of it, but you'll see um, images there, the icon, the favicon is there. Uh, some directive information, 
uh, other images, index, uh, my index.html, so any of my HTML files have to be in there. Um, my script files uh, that get built have to be in there. Any, anything you want cached has to be explicitly named here, but you can use wildcard naming as well. So I could just put star in here and tell it to cache everything that's in my web app directory, and it will do everything. Problem with that is it will actually cache your asynchronous AJAX calls if you did that. And it'll actually do that if you don't put the network equal to star there. That's basically the fallback. What to do if I don't know the network is what to do. If I can't find something in cache, what should I do with it? So I tell it to fall back to network on anything that you don't know. I could also put in here, if you're running a fully offline application that you never want it to connect back to the internet, um, so you could put a to-do list in, store everything locally. It doesn't actually ever connect back to the internet at all. Everything's there. Um, I could put a, like a default page there that just says like unknown page, bad URL, hit it back, and then it would just load that instead of going to the network. But I'm telling it to go to the network because on our system, we're going to make a bunch of AJAX calls to pull JSON data from the server that these files will then be able to load and know what to do with. So single page application as a mobile app. And you know, you're still going to need to call out and get data when you're offline. So that's what that network star is. That's a really important call. Otherwise, you put all your app cache in place, and you can't figure out why nothing works. So that takes a little bit of time when you first get going. Um, and the thing about app cache is for all of these sections, we'll also put in the uh, can I use tables so you know what is supported and what's not. So app cache, pretty well supported all the way across the board, except for Opera Mini, but nobody uses Opera Mini, so we don't really care. It's, it's, it's all used. The one thing you have to look at, though, is it's not supported until IE 10. So if you really need back support, then it is. But to be honest, if you're writing something that's offline capable mobile web app, IE 8 is not really a target of yours, so you're fine. The big things we want to look at is down the end there. Um, iOS Safari has been supported for a while. It's actually supported well beyond that, too. Um, and then Android has been supported for a long time. That actually goes well back to 2.3. I should have done the display all so we could see some more of the older stuff for some of these other browsers. But App Cache is really well supported, works in basically everything that you need it to work in, um, and works pretty well. So you definitely can do App Cache, which doesn't really help you until we can get some of these <laughs> offline things and store data, because all this is really storing is our interface. If we do it, we still really need to be online for everything. So let's talk about being on offline and really doing some offline functionality and storing data offline is really what we're talking about because we know JavaScript can do everything we want it to do offline. It's a full, fully capable language. Uh, we won't get into the argument of whether it's a good language or not, but it's a fully capable language that can do anything we want it to do. Um, and the first way to store it that's been around for the longest is web storage. And web storage is a single persistent object basically a global object in memory, and you can store whatever you want. And there's two variables that are created for web storage. One is the local storage object, which is a persistent object. It will be there forever. You close the window, you close the browser, it's still going to be there unless somebody <coughs> manually clears it themselves. If they clear all their cache in their browser, it's going to go away. But it's there persistently forever through everything. The other object is session storage. And it kind of is exactly what it sounds like. It's open only for the session. Once they close that window, go to another web page, you are now going to lose that session. Then you have to start it over. But it's local to the user. And this is also the easiest uh, protocol to use because it's just an object. Um, there's two different ways to do it. One is local storage.setItem, and you can set it. The other one is you can set directly on it. Um, even though you can set directly on the object, I don't recommend it because if you set directly to the object, not every browser supports the event firing sequence that happens here. So what's also nice about this local storage is it has an eventing system. And I can listen for whenever local storage changes. And in that event message will tell me what, what object on it changed and what was the old value and the new value. So if I have multiple tabs running on my same application, I can do some interesting things as well as if you wanted to write kind of your own two-way binding or any kind of that stuff, you can use this messaging system to do that and kind of watch for stuff. So you really should probably do set item um, and la or set item and get item, even though 
it will work on a lot of browsers. Not every single browser will support the event messaging when you set directly on the object. So um, just to kind of think about it. And then it's uh, really the same thing for session storage. They work exactly the same way. It just depends on how things are going to be kept and how aren't things going to be kept. So some of the pros to this is obviously support. I'll show that in a second. Most browsers support this. Uh, it's been around the longest. All your mobile browsers are going to be supporting this, so which is really nice. It's really simple. It's all synchronous. You don't have to worry about asynchronous abilities, anything like that. You can declare on it. And then the event structure that's built right into it to tell you things are changing is also really nice. Yes. So, well, OK. Yes, because on the mobile apps, you're basically only getting a tab, what is, yeah. what is technically a tab in there. So if they clear all of their history for the browser, it's going to clear the history that you have in your application as well. Okay. Yes. So, um, I mean, in Android, you could write your own and, or get a library that had its own web view in it that wasn't connected to Chrome or to the, to the browser. In iOS, you don't have that option. You'd have to use the oh, yeah. UI or the, the new diff, OK, whatever the new, uh, yeah, the, the new one is. So, um, And then some of your cons, it's very unstructured. It's literally just basically a global object. So if you've got a lot of data, you know, big things, this is going to get real slow real quick. You've got to kind of just simple value key pair storage. Now, I can put whole objects in here. I can put a JSON object. I can do whatever I want. But I don't have ac any access to search it. It's slow to pull large data, because it is actually going to pull it off the file system at some point. And if I put a large amount of data on it, there's no indexing, and I have to wait for it to be done. It's not asynchronous. It's not like I say, start loading this data, and then I'll come back and get it later. You have to wait for that to finish, because it is a single synchronized you know, going on there, so kind of thinking. But it's real nice, and it's real quick if you just need to do it. Um, and it's a nice fallback, because as we look at the can I use, it's really available um, for most anything. I really should have put more for the Android browser. I didn't realize we didn't go far enough back. But um, it goes back to 2.3 as well. So anything that any Android, even if you're trying to support the old stuff, you can still use this. Um, and it works really well. And again, the only thing that really doesn't work in is Opera Mini, because Opera Mini doesn't have offline storage. So, But again, nobody uses it, so we don't care. Even <laughs> IE, all the way back through 8, supports this. So it's really. It's pretty old. It's a well-supported protocol. Works. It's really simple. Nothing, nothing to it. I can store it both for the session and for the local storage, which is nice. None, none of the other um, APIs have a session-based paradigm in them at all. They're all just, um, well, that's not true. I guess technically the file one has a, a temporary space, which is session-based. But um, this is really the only one that kind of differentiates that. If you want to do sessions, you'd have to do that yourself to clear data and create data based on session state. All right, so let's look at WebSQL. This, is, this was fun. This was really exciting. Everybody thought this was going to be the way that we did offline storage and mobile applications. There was a lot of force behind this. This is the way it was going to go. And then they deprecated it. So that's one of the big cons for this, is it's now deprecated. Um, it's actually fairly well supported, um, except for some of the new Firefox stuff. That's, the people are just starting to pull it out right now. Uh, basically, uh, but uh, it's still in WebKit. You can still use it. I figured I would talk about it because when people talk about offline storage, people are going to men mention it and talk about it, but it is deprecated. Um, but basically, uh, it's a little bit more complex. It gives you a full relational database inside of the browser. It's basically an SQL light paradigm. The reason it was deprecated is because like SQL always is, no one can agree on what the syntax really is for SQL. And nobody knew if they wanted to use Transact SQL, if they were going to use a pure SQL 99, if they were going to use one of these other standards for the SQL language itself within this. And then people realized, hey, we can barely get browser companies to work together at all. Why should we add one more language that they're going to have to work on and a bunch of prefix stuff? So that's basically why it got deprecated is because of the SQL syntax itself is what caused it to deprecate out. But um, it's kind of simple. So um, you open a database. Uh, you give it a name, that DB name there. I would name it whatever I want. I give it a version, so it has versioning. Um, I can give it a description, so that way I have that information. And then that 
last parameter is actually the, the size I want to create the database when I open it, which is a pretty odd paradigm. Um, and the newer browser, some of the supporting, you don't have to give it a thing, and it'll just open the database for you. But you have to know sizing, which gets a little weird. Um, every one of these storages are different across every browser of how much space they give you and don't. What's at least nice about it right now is that most of the browsers will just pop up a little message when you go over the default allowed limit and just prompt the user to tell them, hey, this app wants to use more memory than the 5 meg or 25 meg limit that we have. Is that OK? And they can just say OK, which is iffy, because sometimes they say no, and then everything crashes. Um, but you can, you can kind of figure out what you want to do and how you want to handle that. But you can actually tell it ahead of time how much space I'm going to open up for this protocol, which is nice, uh, but also sucks, because you have to tell it how much space you're going to use before you're going to use it. Um, the other thing is, like a relational database, you have to pre-set up. I didn't put that code in here, but you have to create a schema, create tables, you know, add columns, add indexes, do all of that in kind of the setup portion before you can access anything. It's not dynamic, just like local storage, where I'm like, OK, store this variable as name, and here it is. It's boom, it's there. It'll auto-create it. I need to pre-create that schema, which is a little bit of a drawback. But if you've used databases in the past, you're kind of already used to doing that anyway. So you kind of do it. So um, it's all asynchronous. So we're going to be dealing with a whole bunch of callbacks and uh, things like that, which are much better for perform per performance. I can go back and do other things and let it go. But it is a little bit you know, harder for me. So I create a transaction. And uh, basically, in the transaction, I tell it what to do upon success. So I give it a callback. Usually, you do this right in line. There's no reason to do your callbacks not right in line most of the time when you're just doing a transaction call because you're not really storing a lot of state for it. Um, and then it's going to return the created transaction to the callback, which is happening here. And we use that transaction to actually execute SQL on it. So again, it's fully relational. So I have transactions. I have data integrity. I have all that kind of stuff I want. So what I do is I give it a query. Um, I can give it any parameters to go into that, uh, into that query. So it's kind of handling some data cleansing for you. If I want to, my parameter, I didn't mind. I didn't pass anything in. And then I give it two callbacks, what to do on success, what to do on error. You could pass these in line. I prefer to create the functions separately. And in my success callback, I get a tra the transaction back of it, as well as the results. And here. I'm just alerting some of my results out. So this is how you get results. So you're basically getting results that have a list of rows attached to them. And then you'll need to get an item off of that rows that's basically an array. Um, and then that dot ID is an actual column name I have on that table. So I can just do rows dot item, whatever the number is. I might probably would loop through this in a, in a for loop and get each one, and then do dot the name of my column. And it'll return to me. So things here I'm not doing that, I pr that it should be done if this was code is check to make sure that rows is not null and that rows actually has at least one record in it and that kind of stuff. You need to do those checks. But here, I'm just trying to alert it out. And then the error callback uh, just returns me again the transaction that errored. So I can try to get some information off the transaction if I want to. And then an error uh, object, which has a code and a message. So here, I would just say, let's just alert it out if I get it. So it's. Fairly, it's more complex than local storage, but it's still not too crazy. And but you have to know SQL to use this protocol as well. And it seems to be less and less developers nowadays know SQL. They're kind of it's being a little bit more. You're getting more focused, so I think less people know it. But any well, it's, a whole, it's a whole technology too. Yeah, I mean it's a whole technology stack to know and things like that. So. I, that was one of the issues with this as well, is they were like, it's much harder to use because now I need to know a whole other language to use the database. Plus so, all the stuff about is it indexed or not? What yeah, performance issues. Yeah. Yeah, performance issues are driven a lot by the user. Did I index it properly? Do I have it far and keyed properly? Relations. Yeah. It does full joins, all of that kind of stuff, which is pretty interesting and everything. So, when we look at support, um, so IE has never supported this. Microsoft was the big one behind. This wasn't going to work. We've been doing SQL forever. Nobody's going to agree on this. And actually, in this case, they were right. Um, so they never supported it, never implemented it, never intended to. So they don't. Firefox, the older versions of Firefox actually supported this. The newer versions don't. So they pulled it back out. Um, so it's not there. And then um, mostly everything else does. And your um, mobile platforms all support WebSQL. 
So if you want to use this on the mobile, you currently can, but it's getting removed um, from Blink, which is what Chrome's built on. So it's going to come out. It's not going to be moved from Safari as quickly because we're going to talk about IndexedDB next, which is what people are implementing now. And uh, WebKit's version of IndexedDB is actually built on top of WebSQL. So we're the SQL database that's there already. So I think it's probably going to take them a little bit longer to remove that, which would be my guess that it'll be around a little bit longer if you wanted to use it. But I don't recommend it because it's definitely going away. If you already have it, you probably don't have to get rid of it just yet. But it's going to go away and go away quickly. So um, everybody's pretty hot and heavy on IndexedDB. But we'll move on to that. So IndexedDB, this is a collection of indexable object stores. Okay, No columns, no anything. Key value pair, basically what you're doing, but every value is a JSON object. So you're putting in Java objects, JavaScript objects into these object stores, and then you can create indexes on any value that's going to be in the, the, Java, the JavaScript object. And you can do things like ordered indexes, unique indexes, required indexes. Those type of things. So you, it's kind of a, it's supposed to be the happy medium between local storage and WebSQL. A little bit simpler, and try to get rid of some of these issues that we had with WebSQL. And we're going to put it in IndexedDB, and it's a collection of object stores. So I still need to declare object stores up front, but all I really need to declare on them is how to key them if I want. Which basically your options on creating an object store is: Do I want it to be an auto incremented key? Or do I want to create a key from a specific object on my object, so an attribute of my object, um, to, be, uh, to be indexed on? Other than that, I don't have to do anything. But I might also want to create indexes on it, which makes searching easier. So for any index I have, I can retrieve objects in any order, ascending or descending, as well as I can get an object that has an attribute value that matches, as long as I tell it to create an index on that attribute. It will do that. So it's kind of, it looks a little bit similar to how we opened the database before. These calls look kind of similar to the asynchronous ability that comes in WebSQL. They just kind of broke things out a little bit differently. Uh, so first of all, I open a database. And all I have to do is give it a name. That name needs to match how I created my database. So what's nice about this is WebSQL, I have one SQL database per domain. Um, this, I can um, create as many databases as I want for my single domain. I can't access any, any, all of these local storage protocols are secured and sandboxed based on domain and subdomain. So if I create a, like us, we have app.racenote.com is where our app runs on. We can access those databases. If I'm running on app.racenote.com, I cannot access a racenote.com domain. So everything's subdomained and everything's, everything's sandboxed and secured that way, as well as port. If I change the port, uh, it doesn't allow me to access those same, uh, domain, those same databases either. So the database has to be created under my subdomain, my port, all of that, whatever I'm doing uh, to run there. So I open the database. It opens for me. It is asynchronous, even the open event. So I have to do a on request.success, where it actually opens. I do this. I don't have an error call for this, but I could put on a request.error and print out my error and let people know that the database didn't open for whatever reason. Usually, that's because of a um, creation problem when it's created in versions. So you can create versions and only you know, basically migrate back and forth down versions. Uh, if something happens there, it's going to error and send it to you. This on success will wait for those creation migrations to run and get you to the most current state before success fires. So um, that's good. It'll just sit around and wait. So this is asynchronous and sometimes will take time to load versus others, depending on what you're doing. And uh, once success happens, I, I send it. I get an event. And in the event, I'm going to have um, a source element with a result. And that's the actual DB. So I need to store it. Here I'm storing that locally. You always probably want to do this locally to open. So it's not exactly thread safe. It's supposed to be thread safe, but there's some issues across some databases. So I recommend opening the database when you need it and closing it. Once the database is created, it opens very quickly. So it shouldn't be too big of a deal. If you run into real specific performance problems, you can make this global 
and just access the same database, but then you're going to have to worry about making sure you've got some thread safe stuff and nothing's going to go crazy on you. But um, then I'm going to open a transaction. And basically, for a transaction, in those brackets, I can open specific object stores within my database, um, which I recommend. Here I just opened every object store because it's just test code. But um, I recommend only putting the object stores you need to open because it'll save you memory and, and loading time and all that. So just put the name of the object store you want or not. And then the next parameter is whether I want a read-only or I want a read-write transaction. And the same thing here. If you only need to read, put read only. If you need to do read write, then do it because you're going to create a lock on that transaction if you if you create a if you open a write. So don't open a write unless you need a write because if you do reads, then you won't lock and multiple transactions can execute at the same time. Or relatively, JavaScript is not multi-threaded, so you're not going to have that problem. But you it will at least run within the same transaction. But um, so then I get a request and I need to create a um, I need to open a cursor on my transaction. So I'm doing the specific object store I want. I still need to open the, tr the object store, even if I only put test as my object store into my parameter. I still need to say open the specific object store, but at least it won't prep them in the memory. And then I just do an open cursor because I'm not doing anything particular. Now I could open an index and give it an index name and a direction. I'm just saying open cursor, which will basically return every object that's in that object store. That's what open cursor is going to do for me. And then I'll handle moving through it as I need. But if I had any indexed columns or attributes on that, then it would, um, it would open based on that index. And I can do descending or I can do a filter on those indexes. So, um, and then again, we have an on success and an on error. So I need to set those to, um, to functions. It doesn't matter if I set my functions. Well, it matters after I create the object. But you can do this after the fact because JavaScript is a functionally complete language. So it won't actually execute that object store.open cursor until this function is done, com done completing. So it doesn't matter. I can do it after the fact. And um, all I'm going to do is, again, alert it. And I'm showing you how to get it out. You get an event back on success. And in it has a target and a result. And that result is an array of every object that would have been pulled based on your query to the object store. In this case, it was every one. So I just say, give me the first row and print the ID, just like I did um, in the MySQL example. And then I did the same thing on error. And you'll see a little bit about how this isn't exactly 100% completely supported in every protocol across it. So I have an etarget.webkit error message, because there's still some prefixed values that sit around in it. Um, some of the browsers support this error object that comes back, but you almost Every browser supports just the code coming back. So I kind of have to do that if I really want to get what the error message is coming back. It's a little bit more complex. Um, so you walk through. One other thing, if you're really using this, that you should really know is the transaction also has a complete callback. So most of the time, you don't have to worry about the complete if you're just writing data because you'll have enough time. But if you're writing data and then going to read it back out immediately, you have to actually wait for the complete event to fire before any other tra you're guaranteed that any other transaction will be able to read that data because it's getting written asynchronously. And they're trying to tell you as quickly as possible that, yes, your write works. It will write. We have no problem. But it's not actually written to the store, so that way anything else. So if you have other read-only transactions that are happening asynchronously with this, you're not guaranteed that they're going to do it because Complete means that that lock has been released. So on a write transaction, it's going to say, yes, I've released my lock. It's ready to go. Other transactions can now run. And you'll be able to do those things. So it took me a long time to figure out why a bunch of stuff I was writing wasn't getting written into the database. And it actually was. Everything was happening fine. I wasn't waiting for the on complete message to fire through. And I'd be willing to bet that you will not see an example code anywhere that's waiting for the on complete message to fire because it's just one of those weird ed cases. I'm writing it in and then want to read it right back out immediately and uh, make sure that I'm in sync. So just something to think about. So uh, some of the good pros of this is the performance is really good. It's better performance than your WebSQL is going to be, um, especially when it comes to large pieces because it's a little less complex. Not a great as performance as like local storage would be if you're using small objects, but, much, but scales much better and performs much better moving forward. I say generally because. We're writing an application with AngularJS. And between the two technologies on top of each other, they don't react fast enough. And there's a big delay 
So we have to keep two versions, one in memory and then updating our IndexedDB for persistent storage ourselves, um, just to know. And then uh, it supports versioning, which is really nice. So you can kind of do migration scripting sets in a single file, and it makes things nice and easy to, to take care of. And then it's also nice, it's a fully transactional data model. So if you're doing stuff and are trying to make sure of it as long, you know, everything happens in a transaction, you can do a series of events and then roll back a transaction if something uh, doesn't work well, which is nice to be able to use. Some of the cons is it's a little bit more complex of an API. You still have to kind of figure it out, but not nearly as complex as having to learn SQL, which is nice. Um, and then another thing is we'll see um, when I show you um, the support, you do need a polyfill, especially if you're doing mobile web, because iOS just did put this in uh, in iOS 8, and it was implemented like a piece of crap, and it's too buggy to use. So it actually made all your polyfills break, because people say, you know, you look for the object and it's there, but it, it's crappy. They built it on top of um, my, in, on top of the SQL, and they didn't put object store name into the index field for those things. So if you're using like auto indexing IDs that just start at one, two, three, four, five, you'll start learning, if you have two object stores, what happens is you put object one, two, three, four into object store A, and then you come back into object store B and you put objects one and two in, it erases the two out of this other object store because there's a, because they the IDs match and puts them into this other object store over here. So now you end up with one object stores with three and four and another object store with one and two. So if you have any collisions of IDs, which again, auto incrementing, you're going to have a lot of, um, or your own IDs, you're most likely going to have ones of, it's going to start doing. And when you're the person that finds that and have to put a bug report into both WebKit and Apple, it makes you think you're crazy. Trust me, there was about three people around the world apparently working on this at the same time and uh, we happen to find each other and try to figure out what's going on and one guy, we, th we all thought it was a transactional issue with collisions and something of the nature and one guy finally tracked the problem and then we pulled out the actual code for the implementation and found the problem and so it, you can't use this in iOS 8. Extremely buggy, that was one of the major bugs but there's two other major bugs in it and it's actually in the WebKit implementation that was put into the repository. So it's a WebKit and iOS problem. So even though I'd love to just blame Apple for this, it's bigger than just them. Um, but nobody decided to, I don't know, test it or look at it, you know, developers and testing. Uh, so it's not supported really great. What's luckily though is with a polyfill and a good polyfill, uh, I recommend the one from CouchDB because they did a really good job with it. Um, or um, there's some um, forks of the polyfill that's out there that actually have the iOS 8 skipping. We have to actually look at user agent strings because there's no way to kind of sniff it out, um, but uh, are out there. So anything in this light green means that it needs uh, a polyfill in order for it to work. So uh, iOS is the big thing for that. That's going to be it as well as it's not supported in Android without the polyfill until 4.4. So in the mobile section, this is a little not, but the polyfill works really well because it falls back to WebSQL, which is supported, which there are a little bit of issues there, but for the most part, works pretty well. So you can use it. This is the direction I recommend that you go, but I guarantee you, you will have issues with especially integrating it with other frameworks and stuff like this because it is still really pretty new. But if you're pushing the edge and you want to do offline mobile web, and you don't want to use PhoneGap or tie yourself to some sort of JavaScript bridge with native implementation, this is the way to go with a good polyfill and have fun working through the layers. Um, if you're doing it, let me know. I can probably point you in the direction of some of the issues. But uh, The last one we'll talk about a little bit is File System API. This is actually the ability to have access to a sandbox portion of the file system and storage large files and binary objects directly to the device um, from, uh, from the web browser, which is great. It's awesome. Um, but it's barely implemented anywhere, which is one of the kind of drawbacks to it, but it's something to talk about and know as we move forward if you're going to do uh, photos, videos, that kind of stuff, and want to make it offline available to people. This is the way you're going to have to do it. 
Um, so in our system right now, we just you don't have access to photos and th other than small images that we know the size of, and we base 64 encode and put them in local storage. But um, this is the way that you're going to do large blobs and binary files. Uh, one of the drawbacks to this, though, is there's no searching. There's no way to kind of get a list of the files that exist there. You have to kind of already know what's in your own file store. Uh, and it's sandboxed only for you, so the thought process is you should know what you wrote and what you didn't, so it shouldn't be a big deal that it's not implemented for you. But there's only two calls um, in this, basically, at the top level. And um, that's to basically request the file system or request a specific URL. Yes, I rec yeah, I probably wouldn't rec I mean, if you're going to offline your files, you should probably offline your, your index of yeah. what those files are, too. Yeah. But technically, you could put it on the server, but then that would kind of make it a I mean, then it would just be caching yeah. um, at a file, file level. But yes, um, yeah, you basically have to create an index DB or local storage uh, yeah. array of. Yeah, even if you put it on your server, getting the, a file name from your server will have to be the Getting the file itself. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you want to use it to cache, then you can pull it from the server. But yeah, so basically you need to keep in a, a list of where these exist. Um, so what I do is I request the file system itself. Um, and again, the file system is going to uh, this window.persistent. This is what, if you wanted a session-based file storage, so to do kind of caching, you could put window.temporary, and then it will remove this. It's not exactly session-based, though, because it's cleared by the... And uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure exactly what the qualifications of when it clears them and when it's not. And it, it might be a memory thing. I, I don't remember. But um, And then you have to give it a size, um, again, of what you're, you're talking about. So they're looking at um, 1024K here. And then you give it a success callback and an error callback um, that come out similar. Again, everything's all asynchronous. We, OK. Um, and then I do I get root is what's returned to me. So I get a file system object back, and I can get its root. And then in root, I can get a file right out of it. So I do a get file and get the file name. Um, that I can create it if it doesn't exist. And then um, I have a function that returns to me the file. And um, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm actually creating a new file here. So I give it a name, tell it to create it instead of just open it. And it'll return me an asynchronous object once it has a reference to that space. And then I, I can create a writer uh, from the file. And then it's a pretty standard JavaScript buffered writer that I get, file writer object. And then on write, I can do something. And on error, I can do something. So whatever you want to do there. And here, I'm just going to, this is a blob builder. So it's putting a new blob together. And then it's writing out. It's actually doing the write there. And then that on write will tell me when something happened. And in case anything happens, I can call my same error callback that I was going to call when I open the object. And all I'll do there is alert it. That is a file error that comes back, so a whole new thing. And the only thing it returns to you is a code. That's the only thing on the object. And it's a list. There's an enumerated value there that you can look at of what those codes mean. I don't know why they don't give you a message, but they don't. They just give you the code. So. Um, I think these are standard builders through the JavaScript. I don't know that they're specific to file stuff, because you could build these into memory and stuff, I think. But uh, my guess is there are. I don't know. I, I haven't done a lot with file API. I just wanted to make sure that we talked about it a little bit. Um, and like I said, it's, it's got poor, it has really poor support right now. So you can't really use it um, at the time being. You can't use it on mobile uh, kind of at all, but it's coming. It's a fairly new standard. Everybody sort of agreed on, yeah, this seems to be pretty good. But they're going to add, it's, there's only two um, functions on the specification, which again is like open this file system and then and give me a specific URL uh, on a file system, a URI through the file system. Um, and that's all that's on the spec. So my guess is you're going to see a bunch of different prefixed methods kind of coming out that do some more specific things. So until that kind of works out, it's there. I, like I said, I don't really recommend it unless you're like, I got to do this because it's the only way my app works. And then uh, you can run in Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of where you're stuck at, at this point. Or, yeah, or you know, put it into WebKit and uh, you know, write the code to put it in the WebKit and see if anybody will take the fork. And then maybe you'll be OK, too. 
but uh, it's, it's worth talking about it. We started looking at it and tried to look into it a bit, but it's just not supported well enough for us to do what we want. So we just tell people you don't get file access when you're offline is the way we handle the problem. <laughs> so that may not be the answer for everybody or allowable, but. Yeah, I think it will. So um, my guess is, I mean, it's it's in the Chrome version for Android, so it'll it'll work there already, and that's what I mean, they're going to phase out the Android browser. At least anything that's Google certified is not really going to have the Android browser in place much longer. So you can use it on Chrome for Android, and um, I, it's I don't know. It's just Apple. They want to make sure it's done right before they try to release it. They're, that's what they always say when it comes to Safari and everything, and. I think they're fighting back a little bit because Chrome forked WebKit to go to Blink and all that stuff, but it'll come. It, it's, it'll be there. Everybody keeps asking, hey, if I have file storage, off, if I have offline capabilities and other storage, why can't I store a whole file? And they seem to figure out the security with the, in, you know, the sandboxing for at least the meantime. So it should be coming to mobile. So. Oh, yeah? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So, if I was going to start my current application over again, I probably would use PouchDB. Uh, no, I don't actually care about the syncing. It's just they've done a really good job to make it cross all of these kind of technologies that are a little weird to get them working right. Um, the guy that I was working with, that I was talking back and forth a little bit with the IndexedDB issue. Uh, he's the developer on PouchDB that got this working. Um, we don't use CouchDB in the back end. We have a full relational database on our, ba on our server, but then use object stores on the front end. So we can't really do direct syncing the same way, but we probably could have written like a Couch interface to our database. And it would, I don't like automatic syncing because I don't have the control that I need to get my data when I need it and the which exact data I have most of the time. You got to worry about lockings, and it just wants to send all that stuff and back. So I'm not a big fan of the automatic syncing of something like Pouch and Couch, uh, but um, I do like PouchDB and what they're doing there, and their offline capabilities with models, and they add a few overlaps. So if I was going to do it again, I'd really look really seriously at trying to implement it with PouchDB. Um, probably would be a lot easier too if you have a CouchDB server like Firebase. They interface with through Pouch, and like if you want to do offline. Offline capable web apps with a like a cloud backend hosted for a service, like it seems like it'll work really well if you're doing like kind of fairly simple data exchange stuff. I think it'll do really well just because I've dug into the pouch, you know, code a bit and I like the way it's written. I think it's probably good, but I haven't used it actually myself, um, and I haven't used it. What was the other one? I haven't used Forerunner at all. Okay, so similar to like a pouch. Yeah, but it's. It, still runs on IndexedDB and it took me a couple of libraries to get IndexedDB, and I was also trying to do IndexedDB in Angular. So like I have like an IndexedDB polyfill, and then like an Angular library that turns this on success, on error stuff, and the promises, and allows me to pass promises around. And I had to mess with both of those layers to get it going. So it got a little bit, and then I put another layer of our own on top of it. Yeah, so it got a little things, but there was a lot of, you know code that was written under there that could be done. So it, it's kind of weird, but it's, yeah, it's amazing what it does, except when it stops working, and then I want to tear my head out. But that's for you. So yeah, so at, um, right now, the newest, the just release of, of Chrome works pretty well with their dev tools. They have a nice. Um, resource to look at index DB uh, before I was on canary because just the nightly builds had a had more was refreshing better and looking things better uh, but the tool in, in Chrome is working really well uh, the one in um, well Safari doesn't work because index DB doesn't really work but the tool itself has also got a bunch of bugs and problems with it it's in the standard webkit build so I, I recommend Chrome and that's the problem too. you use the polyfill and then all of a sudden, you start getting these errors on Safari, and then like I forgot that I had a polyfill running on Safari versus actual IndexedDB, and why wasn't it working? And there's problems with sync. Um, certain things have to be synchronous on WebSQL, like the opening of the database on WebSQL is synchronous, but it's not in 
index DB. So when you put a polyfill in place, it kind of does some weird stuff. So you just got to make sure you realize some of that and put some exceptions and some watching in place to make sure things are happening when you use these polyfills on top of it. But hopefully, WebKit will get this bug fixed, and Apple will bring the bug fix in, and we won't have this issue in iOS 9, I guess. But they kind of got stuck with that whole not being able to load a file thing with 8.11 and everything, so they were kind of ignoring our IndexedDB stuff. They're like, well, nobody's using that anyway. But it screwed the polyfills, because it used to just say, does IndexedDB exist on the window? Oh, no, it doesn't? Then use my polyfill. Now I have to say, I have to actually do a user agent sniffing because it does exist on my window. It just doesn't work properly. And unless I try to crash the database, I don't know that it's not. You know, we'd have to do a bunch of writes and then some reads. And it just would take too long to figure out that if it's working properly or not. So we do a bunch of user agent sniffing, which I don't really like to do. But that's what you got to do. Yeah, PouchDB has the same polyfill in it that I'm using. So it does user agent sniffing, yeah. Well, PouchDB had this problem until we found it. And then they added the same manual change that I added into my library. So they basically have the same exact, they have the same exact chunk of code, unless he's changed over the last few weeks since I haven't looked at stuff. But he found a better way. But. Mm -hmm. If you're writing like an offline app, do you recommend you generally do you have like a like basically like a service layer then in your web app that like you would normally have on your server or mm -hmm. whatever? You just basically build that into your web app. Yeah, I I now have three data layers to worry about. So I have a service data layer, mm -hmm. I have index DB data layer, and then I have an in memory data layer. And I have a series of services that keep all of those in sync. So that way, the front end doesn't even have to worry about it. Somebody does a write, it writes it to memory asynchronously. It writes it down to index DB and sends it off to the server. Any one of those things can fail. And it picks, it's, it's a complex mess of crap. But it's for performance basing. You don't have to put that in memory layer. But I couldn't get Angular and index DB to be to my standard of performance that I wanted to see without things flashing for people. I'm trying to get it to feel like a native app without having to write the code three times, because we have two developers. And I just don't know how I can manage Android, iOS, and web, all of, all of that code. I just can't figure out how to do it. I'm a, a native guy. I'd much rather write it native. But I don't have the staff, like when I was here at CRI, to have to write things a bunch of times and try to figure it out. So. I've, I've got to do this, but the performance to me is not where I want it. So it might be a little bit of me being picky, but I, I guess I'll stop when I start crashing the browser because I have all of my memory, all, all of my data in memory. But we'll see. <laughs> Which methods are annihilated by the user query in the camera? You know, like you said earlier. Everything is annihilated when the all when. Of the, these methods. Yes, everything is completely clear. Somebody clears their cache now. Some things are different. So in um, Safari, I have the ability to clear based on domain, but I have to clear everything. In Chrome, I can clear based on domain and by type of data that I want to I just want the IndexedDB database to go away, but I want to keep some of the other stuff. At least on the nightly builds, I can. I don't know if that's fully down yet. But um, so that's kind of nice to play around when you're doing development. But if a user clears the cache. Most of the time, the user is just clearing all of their cache across the entire you know, it, browser completely. So it's going to annihilate all of this stuff. So all of this is transient data. right? That's the way you have to treat it. And that like my server just loads this down there, so you can use it while you're offline, but it's still syncing back to the server. There are tons of examples, though, of people using these that are doing like to-do lists and stuff like that, where they're just saying, you never have to talk to my server ever. You connect, you download, it writes everything in your database. But to me, that's kind of weird, because it's easy for somebody to say, oh, I just want to clear my password history. And then they click the other button that says, like, clear all your browsing data. And pfft, now their to-do list is gone. And it only exists on that device. It can't communicate to another device. It can't sync around. But this, you know. So I, I do recommend syncing it back and forth to the server. But theoretically, you don't have to. There's no reason that this, this can run. You can create an application that does nothing but run in the browser like it's its own operating system. And it'll just do that. But you probably don't want to do that. I can't see a great business reason why you'd want to do that, I guess is what I would say. 
Um, but if you're wrapping it in like a phone gap or just a web view, you might want to do it because, well, I guess not a web view on iOS, but maybe if you're on Android and you create your own library of a web view, then you're kind of controlling them being able to clear that data or not. Then you could write a whole app right there. But if you're only going to write it for Android like that, then you should just do it native. There's no point in jumping all those hurdles. But um, phone gap uh, might support this a little bit differently. They do some weird things around some of these local storage APIs that they try to hijack to make them work nicer and more smoothly across platforms. So, and I don't know the specifics of phone gap of how it's handling some of the real specific pieces of what they do. So they're trying to roll back to the web views as much of that as they can. But Sometimes they don't do that, so. And I have no idea what some of the other frameworks are doing, so. IO and stuff. Yeah, I mean, the thing about the local, well, about the cache manifest, I ran into that when I was working on my stupid torrent shipping app. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and uh, that, you know, I was, I was violating, I was expiring the cache by, um, just, you know, incrementing a version manually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do, you think, do you guys play at all with trying to basically sort of like block page state on like looking for that? Um, that yeah, you could. Yeah, I mean, well, the problem with the cache event is, uh, yes, you could. What you'd have to do is block the load right away all the time, mm -hmm. and then know if the cache loaded, and know. Yeah, the problem is it's tough. No, you couldn't. Because the only events you have is like, I just loaded a page from cache, or <coughs> I'm, or there's new cache to load. You don't know, I got a response back from the server that said the cache is fine. That message doesn't exist, as far as I know. Like, yeah, you asked the server. Maybe could you try to get the resource load from the browser? I'm not sure. I don't think there's an event for that to know. I'm asking the server said everything's good. So I think you have to load the page. The best thing you could do is like load the page and then automatically refresh the page for the user okay. and give them some sort of feedback that, hey, I'm just reloading this for you, wait a second, or you, know, you could just wait a little bit of time of what you think should be a response from your server and do it. Because like you said, you do get a message that says, you're now running bad cache, is basically what you get, that you have, you're in a dirty state. And usually what people do is do some sort of drop down across the top that says, you know, you want to reload your page. or Hey, there's newer information. Please click here. And then somebody click, and they, and you fire an automatic, you know, refresh of the reload of the page, is usually the way people handle that state. But all good. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, that's it. There's still um, probably some more beer and pizza and stuff. So if you want some more.